I'm ready. There's some sense of feeling completely alive when you're kind of living on the fringes of your own creativity. I don't really know what I fell for first, if it was the love of travel or if it was love of photography. But I can say that at a certain point, they kind of intersected. I would say that travel was my first interest. At first, it was, I think it was probably wanting to just get out of where I lived. And like being a kid who literally had no passport, you know, never had seen outside of the California border. I was pretty eager to like know the world and just like know what else was out there, you know. I felt like I was kind of overwhelmed by like the politics of the dinner table and, and just uh, this small town that I grew up in. Photography at the time was more of just fun. I mean, it was like going out to the beach with friends on the weekends and just a way to like document everyday life. The, the moment that it kind of clicked, I was like, well, this camera, it could be more than just a tool to document friends. It could be a way to create a career. It could be a way to see the world. It could be a way to do a lot of things. I, I, I felt like that was when I became hyper-focused. That was when everything started to like hone in for me and I realized like this could be my ticket out of here. It's funny because I ended up right back where I was. I still live in Central California. I never left. I realized pretty early on when I started traveling that it was the best place on the planet and it's what still inspires me today. But yeah, that was it. You know, I wanted to know it was out there and I think that's what still makes me want to photograph places is is first I want to experience them, second I want to photograph them. I mean there's been so many projects where I've put in hours and weeks and even years planning and we got there and it was nothing like we had intended. The hardest lesson was Russia, uh, Vladivostok, my first trip to Russia where I ended up having border issues and I got stuck. I got put into a Russian jail cell for about 24 hours before being deported to Korea. And that was after being interrogated for like 10 hours. Like, what are you doing in this country? Why does your passport have the wrong entry date? They thought I forged it. That was a shocker. And I didn't come back getting the waves we had hoped for, getting the story we had hoped for. The article wasn't exactly what our editors thought it would be, but it was a story. And in some ways it was almost more interesting because all of that happened the way it did. You know, in my younger years of traveling, if there's one thing that I, I kind of, I kind of blew it was I, I was scared. You know, I was nervous to know to see the world. I remember, you know, my first time going to the Middle East. I was, you know, sitting with my parents at the dinner table, and they were freaking me out about where I was going and thought I was going to be kidnapped. It was just ridiculous, and I, I totally filtered a lot of really incredible experiences through my camera. The camera for me became this kind of tool to, to kind of put between me and my subject. And all that did was inhibit me from really experiencing some really special things. I wish I would have experienced first and shot second. I feel like nowadays storytelling is such a big important part of my life and career that I, I always try to aim to have the camera as a secondary tool to what I'm actually feeling, to what I'm actually experiencing. And I wish I would have just would have done that more. I mean, people have called my lifestyle nomadic. In many ways, I'm, I'm actually really rooted to you know, to home and the place I call home, Central California, but to, I guess to kind of embark on this nomadic lifestyle, it's a challenging and at times lonely place to be. And one of the things that I've found kind of solace in is to know that I can come home with these stories to share, these stories of these far off places, these wild places, and the, the younger version of myself, I mean, this is what I thrived for, but nowadays, having a family and, and being older, it's overwhelming sometimes. You have to come back and, and realize that no matter what I do, I need to come back. I also need to come back with a story worth sharing. If I just come back with a bunch of photographs and there's nothing really meaningful, no lessons learned, then all that traveling might not really have been worth it. These are kind of the reasons you leave your front door. You, know, you hope to become a better person. So I think, what am I doing when I'm out in the world, when I'm out traveling, when I'm out in these remote places to become a better person? Maybe I'm not, I don't know. The closest I've ever been to quitting was for sure when we were filming Under an Arctic Sky. It's a, it's a movie about surfing under the northern lights in Iceland. There was some really gnarly moments. I mean, negative 10, 20, you're outside shooting at night, your hands are so cold. 
everything's freezing, camera equipment's breaking, drones are breaking, people are getting cut up and getting stitches. And it wasn't even those hardships. I think it was the point in which we, we had done two trips and we came back home after the first trip and we were realizing what we had gotten. We were realizing how special it was and I felt like overwhelmed. I was like, whoa, like we were given this opportunity. We have to, we have to do something with this. And I was looking for funding and I was trying to sort out how to make this film and I was like, I was literally like pulling clumps of my hair out. I was so stressed and I guess I just got to this point where I realized like nobody is gonna make this film happen for me. I have to make this film happen. That second trip was so stressful because there was so much writing on it that it couldn't fail. I almost didn't go. I almost didn't pull the trigger. We almost just didn't make the film because it was, because I guess this, the idea of failure was I was too scared. You know, I was too scared to take that risk, but I knew that had I not made that decision, I would have always, I would have lived my life in a state of wonder, wondering, you know, what would that have been like? What could that project have been had I just like gone? So I'm grateful I did. Oh man, the tipping point. Everybody always wants to know what the tipping point is. When did you make your break? You know what the funny thing is? Is that I don't know where my next paycheck's coming from. <laughs> the day that I decided to leave my retainer at the magazine that I was working for and go totally freelance was the day that I chose to basically never have a secure income again. The truth of the matter is that as a freelance photographer, you never know. You're only as good as the last piece of work that you created. You're only as good as your last photograph. You have to always be hustling and the amount of grit that goes into creating a career like this is it's so overwhelming. I actually feel bad when people ask me, what was that big break? Because I want to tell them, like, it was, you know, I got this photo published and everything was good. It was all good. It was, at that point, from that point on, I was set. But the reality is, like, no, I, I quit everything that provided me security, my job, school, left home, and lived in a car. And for six, seven years, I was struggling. Even now, although, career has flourished, there's always still that insecurity that, hey, if you don't get a job, that could all go away. But there's some sense of feeling completely alive when you're kind of living on the fringes of your own creativity. The ability to just make a living on what you can create with your own two hands and your, your mind and stuff, that's, there's no better feeling. I would rather be broke and trying to be a creative person than, than sit behind a desk. If I look back at a younger version of myself and I could sit them down and be like, hey, this is what you need to do, I would, I would tell them to write more. I would tell them to, to write down those feelings you had, your voice and the stories that you can share and these memories, like photographs for me are an amazing reminder of those feelings, the visceral feelings of being there and the, the smell, the, the sweat, the, you know, the wind, all that stuff. But I wish I, I wish I could remember just some of those like deep impressions that I felt. I wish I had um, journaled more. <laughs> it's kind of funny thinking about it, but that's, that's the truth. I, I wish I would have taken more notes. I wish I would have been more acutely aware because I feel like there's been times in my life and times in everybody's life where we've probably done some pretty amazing things. I wish I would have documented those, not just through photography but through you know, voice notes and just through, through text and, and just like really being able to keep those stories rich in my mind so that when it comes time to share them, whether it's in a book or social media or with your kids, like that they're really real and they're really raw. And I feel like nowadays, I'm just trying to rely on my memory to, to, to bring up all those emotions and feelings because I mean, that's the stuff, that's what makes life good, right? That's the storytelling, right? That's what makes life worth sharing with other people and I feel like when you've lived some of these epic stories, you just you really want to be able to share them as best you can. If I could sum up my love of travel in one photograph, it's funny because it wouldn't, it wouldn't be an action photo and it wouldn't be a landscape photo. It would be this photograph from Nicaragua. Maybe eight years ago, I went down to Nicaragua on a project, but afterwards I stayed a little bit longer with some friends and we went to this area called La Chereca that was basically one of the, like, most heinous places in the world and there's kids being sold into the sex trade and there was you know basically 20,000 people I think living in this massive dump with animals and everything it was one of the most horrendous places I've ever visited in my entire life ever 
I was lucky enough to go in there and experience this. And for my young mind and my, my wife at the time too, we were forever changed, forever changed by that experience. And the, one of the craziest things is that amidst all this burning trash and this and that, people had homes, there was communities there, there was people living and there was actually children that were happy. And that was all based upon their perspective and their experience and they knew nothing else. And I took this picture of this boy who's basically just wearing kind of like a loincloth and right behind him is this big massive cloud that was about to be a microburst, you know, just rain, torrential downpour. And he just has this like look in his eyes that I'll never forget. It's like so deep. I guess it's funny because I'm an action sports photographer, right? But the thing that's always struck me the most about traveling is humanity and the people that I've been able to experience. And uh, that photo for me is, that's the one that keeps me up at night. Not in the sense that it's a place I want to go back and explore more, but just the fact that I know that that boy is out there somewhere and there's a lot of other kids out there. And I hope that in some way later in life or even now my work can support people like that a bit more.